Thank you very much for the informative talk. I have two questions. Okay. Australia and Israel, two colonial settler states whose foundation myths in Australia, the notion of terra nullius, in Israel, the notion of a land without a people for a people without a land, le led in both cases to the utmost cruelty in public policy, the brutal dispossession of and systemic discrimination against the indigenous populations. Given this similarity, would you agree with our Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, when, in February this year, celebrating Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to Australia, he declared that the two states, Australia and Israel, have much in common. <laughs> and is world peace and an end to cruelty in public pol policy possible without social justice and an equitable distribution of political power under the Earth's resources? And I'd like to end with a brief quotation from a poem by Denise Levitov's Making Peace. The poets must give us the imagination of peace to oust the intense, familiar imagination of disaster. For peace is not only the absence of war, but peace, like a poem, in the words of its making, is the grammar of justice and the syntax of mutual aid. A line of peace might appear if we restructure the sentence our lives are making and revoke the crude affirmation of profit and power. Mm. Thank you, Kieran. Fortunately, we have two poets on the panel. <laughs> yeah, look, you, you, you answered your yes. first question. Of course, they have a great deal in common, and there couldn't be uh, a bigger authority than that, than the, the present uh, Prime Minister. Um, that, do you want to respond to that one, or shall we go straight to the second question, which is about world peace? Uh, in, in, and in a way, um, Frank g g gave the cue for that by saying, that by talking about the, the potato famine in Ireland and the notion that um, the freedom of the market, which was a prescription for uh, I don't know, the, the survival of the fittest uh, and for competition, as competition for scarce resources. Yeah, of course, I think... Um, the, uh, the massive inequality and the growing inequality is a time bomb, unless it's addressed. Uh, um, even the best seminars organized by John Hallam um, won't uh, produce a panacea. Um, I just add to that that the colonial mindset, both in Australia and in Palestine, continues to this day. My name is Ken Cregan. It's a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. It was such a wonderful analysis of how cruelty affects people. And people with this psychosis that Vaxi talked about, really they're born leaders. They're the sort of people who are going to gravitate to the top. And the people who are the opposite of this, they're going to gravitate to the bottom. They're going to be the followers. So one can't help feeling that it's a matter of how we choose our leaders that's a serious problem in this. And I wonder if, if what you think about this, how we choose our leaders. Perhaps we shouldn't choose them from a competitive process, which is going to allow these, these um, people with the cruelty streak to come to the fore. Maybe it should be more like a jury system where every four years people are selected at random and asked to come up and they have to fulfil certain obligations of, of uh, good life and education and then, yes, be selected and so, some rejected. So I ask, is our selection of leaders part of the process? Oh, th thank you, Ken. Um, I th you, you've made such an important point that the fundamental flaw in the choosing of the leaders is in our adversarial political system. Adversarial is implicitly, in a sense, cruel. So I, I, I don't have an answer to I would like to see everybody being, or all politicians being independent, and then they can move into, you know, make alliances according to different policies. But I think that while we have this system of two major parties, which are identical, 
Um, and so you have identical leaders. Um, we're going to have a problem with that. We need to change that. Yeah, I, I want to come at it slightly differently. There's leadership all over the place in every kind of institution in which everybody here has spent parts of their lives. Those institutions are called universities, hospitals, law courts, the, um, the, uh, the outfit from which the, um, the highly paid public servant has just resigned of, uh, to do with, um, to do with the, trade, the investigation of the trade unions, particularly the, the CFMEU. So there's leadership. You can, you, can, you can be responsible for creating cultures of trust and reciprocity and fun and support for one another in all sorts of institutions, notwithstanding what goes on in Canberra. So there's plenty of authoritarianism and, and uh, indirect cruelty that goes on in places. It's not just Long Bay Jail. Sometimes I used to think I couldn't distinguish between Sydney University and Long Bay Jail. Um, I, I certainly thought it was often an accident that some people finished up as professors at Sydney University and other people finished up as inmates in Long Bay Jail. I'm not sure if I finished up in the right place. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? No, no, no. no. Um, look, Avachi's dealt with the political. I think there are there are there are there are plenty of prints. I'm not going to, you know, all politicians are bad. There are plenty of princi principal people like uh, Rhiannon and um, the two Greens who just resigned, struggling to, and, and I think Melissa Park, uh, who re resigned as, uh, no longer stood as MP for Fremantle. There are plenty of people struggling to get their heads above the water. Um, but beware that it's not only the leadership in Canberra. You can create, you can create uh, supportive environments for, one, for all of us not least in um, politics in the pub, which is like a, a, um, a mental health walk-in um, <laughs> refuge. Okay, I think I've said enough. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, and I've been impressed by much of what has been said. Um, I, I normally talk about potentially the most cruel thing that could possibly happen, certainly the worst thing that could possibly happen to the entire planet. Um, but I've got something else going through my head at the moment. Um, and that's a memory of a lecture um, on asylum seekers by an exceedingly distinguished lawyer um, quite a number of years ago in which he said something which was dazzlingly politically incorrect and yet, in my view, very deep and insightful, which I'd love to have a response to. And he said, you know, the asylum seeker policy is not racist. Everyone gasps. And he said, no, it's not racist. The way they treat asylum seekers is the way they would like to treat everyone. I hope that there's a response to that. Yeah, well, if you think of the the history of Australia, and I, I'm beware talking about history when there's a insignificant historian in the audience. Um, uh, the fear of the other um, over, over decades and centuries has helped to craft um, Australia's current fears or a current uh, cruel treatment of, um, of asylum seekers. Um, I mean, we get preoccupied with uh, a few thousand people, but there are actually 65 million registered refugees uh, on, on the move, homeless, seeking an end to their journeys around the world. I mean, the biggest movement of people since the Second World War. So it's not, it's not a crisis, it's a permanent state of affairs that we need to accommodate. And... Um, uh, the notion that we should treat them all in the way that uh, John's lawyer, the lawyer John identified, uh, 
is 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 wrong. Um, it's 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 about. I mean, we we're not going to go into um, the means of hospitality as the basis of of much more productive migration policy, but uh, that's that's certainly the substance of my thinking about that issue. There are many things that I could say, but I'd like to ask a general question. Whilst I do not question the good intentions of the speakers and laud their general criticism of the demonization of the people they so fervently represent, I wonder whether the speakers themselves did not indulge in demonizing those whose views they do not agree with. And I simply draw your attention to the Stanford Prison Experiment conducted by Dr. Philip Zambardo. And if you're familiar with it, I'll say no more, or I could just give a little bit about it. But that's a classic experiment in taking ordinary people and making them into prison guards and observing how cruelty develops and evolves in very, very ordinary people. But the critical point really is, to what extent do you think either of you unreasonably demonized those whose views you happen not to agree with? That's a great question. Um, thank you. Yeah, but that's, yeah, I've, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going through my filing cabinet <laughs> at all the criticisms that I've made, particularly. We we'll just talk about the Zionist control the press that you mentioned. The Zionist. Zion. just one very, very key and telling example. Okay. Um, I, I don't I don't think I demonize okay I when I write articles and I'm critical I research thoroughly and I can be very fiercely critical because what I'm critical of is so abhorrent and so contemptible and so cruel that you know, as, as we sit here at this very moment, people are starving in Gaza. Kids are trying to do their homework with candles. There, there are children who... Let me finish. Okay, but I'm, my thing is, is... I feel... I think... I. What I do, I do for two reasons. I do it emotionally because I have that empathy with that suffering. And the other reason is very rational. It's a matter of justice. So I don't think I demonize. No, I, it's not that I don't think. I don't. Yeah, look, when, when he, Seymour Hirsch exposed the cruelty it, that led to, that it was part of the torture in Abu Ghraib, and um, when um, the when WikiLeaks via Julian Assange and his mates exposed the collateral damage, when U.S. pilots from an Apache helicopter said they were going on a turkey shoot and murdered 11 people in the streets of Baghdad, we weren't demonising. We had a responsibility to expose cruelty wherever it is, and. And, 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 and any, any sniff of the argument that you can't, you can't talk about Israel unless you talk about every other country in the world is, not, is simply not on. We happened in this, in this forum tonight to mention about a dozen countries. We finished up even with the British in relation to the Irish. So uh, we have a responsibility in a free, in, under free speech and a democracy to have the guts to expose massive injustices and cruelty and to say we won't have a part of it and I in common with Vachi I don't think that's um, demonizing certainly I lampoon people I lampoon myself I frequently think on a Friday that I'm a complete and you can complete the rest of the sentence but on Monday morning I wake up and start again Thank Emily. Thank you. Thank, um, you. thank you for your incredible talks tonight. And um, this question is actually to all three of you. 
Um, Stuart, you mentioned the importance of the fourth estate and how we rely on people like Seymour Hirsch to bring to light the cruelty that we see and that we don't see, actually. Um, who are the new... Who are, the, who are your personal three favourites, or three of you, who are your personal favourite writers that you think are doing the best job at the moment in the new and social media sphere to bring cruelty to light? And how do we, outside of that sphere, push for greater awareness of what people maybe unknowingly collude and consent to? Well, Frank Stilwell, Varchi, Vlasna, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Look, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald is crucial. The, 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 um, uh, the guy who accompanied uh, Edward Snowden to, to Russia has interviewed him and, and uh, has supported Edward Snowden. Um, uh, Gideon Levy, the very brave, principled journalist of the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Um, incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, look, I'd, I'd still add John Pilger because even if you divide, I know, I know the mainstream media people can't stand the sight of John because he's been so relatively successful. <laughs> but even if you divided by a factor of 10 what he's done, you'd have to say he'd made an enormous uh, contribution. So. That's it. That's it. Um, I like I like some of Stuart's favourites. Um, in in the, in the Palestine matter, for me, Ramsey Baroud. He's um, a Palestinian from Gaza who's now living in Seattle. He he runs um, uh, God, it's fallen out of my head. I'll come to it. Uh, Palestine Intifada or Intifada Palestine, one or the other, I'm sorry. And he's, he's absolutely so committed and he's very, um, you know, he, he sort of pulls out articles every week. He's stunning. Samar Sabawi, she does it through poetry, she does it through drama, and she's the, a phenomenal speaker as well. That's on the Palestine matter. And you know where I get a lot, I get so impressed, is a lot of letters to the editor. I just love hearing, you know, reading what we are all saying and sharing together. It's amazing. And I'm really impressed by the insights and the moral stand that Australians, many Australians have. Thanks for your question, Emily. I'll add my comments. One sounds a little ingratiating, but I have to put Stuart Rees on the list because ever since I've known him, he's been an absolute backlog <laughs> for, for this uh, calling out bullying, cruelty in all levels, from schools through governments through uh, corporations and looking at the systemic roots, not just the psychological individualised roots, but the, the structural roots uh, of, of violence wherever it manifests itself. But also sitting in this room is the author of a number of books that have called out violence. Uh, I'm talking of Eric Paul here. The um, uh, former president of the Council uh, for um, Peace and Justice uh, at uh, the University of Sydney, who's uh, written extensively on this topic. We published him in the journal Australian Political Economy on the political economy of violence. And of course, Ken McLeod, who's uh, uh, McNabb, sorry, uh, who uh, Stuart earlier referred to, uh, a prominent Australian historian who's always imbued his, his own analysis and activism with principles of social justice. So there are great figures on the world stage, uh, but there are also people here in, in this very room who, who are really committed to making a difference in calling out cruelty and promoting the values of social justice. My name is Jan from the committee. Um, so I just wondered if you'd heard of the writer Alice Miller. She died in 2010. She was a psychoanalyst and she wrote about the effects of cruelty on children in the family and how that created the cruel person and particularly psychopaths. And I'm not really sure that psychopaths are born. I think this thing is really important to grapple with, that cruelty starts within the family and maybe even in the womb. 
how the mother is treating herself might result in the way the child comes into the world and the way the brain forms and it's very very much to do with the way the brain forms how a child is treated it acts that actually cr creates the brain. So lots of cruelty will actually create a, br a brain that is incapable of empathy. So it is actually a physical thing. Um, and the same with high IQ and low IQ as well. I think, I think this is all a lot to do with social conditions and family conditions. So I was wondering if you'd like to comment on the role of, of um, childhood teachers and, and the school in in calling out cruelty when they see it and educating children to not be cruel and how we can start maybe, I mean, maybe even a movement amongst teachers of early childhood educators could really start to sort of, you know, like the ethics program that was introduced into schools, which so, so much of the religious um, right wanted to stamp on. Maybe, maybe this could be a way of really bringing a, up an awareness about what cruelty is and how it becomes systemic so that young people grow up understanding the process. I think the role of educators is really crucial. What surprises me is how bullying even exists in schools and that it's only been like a new fad to address it. So that um, I think I think it's really important that there is a moral element or moral it should be it should be right through you know in every, in in every facet every subject to not only that it has that it has moral import but it has relevance look i think whether whether you whether you subscribe to Alice Miller's psychoanalysis or not, yeah, there's plenty of evidence that um, the the person who, who bullies and is cruel has often been regarded themselves, they've learned about it as, as, as a very small child. They've learned about being a victim and they wish to exert revenge for fear of be ever becoming a victim again. So, uh, yeah, that's... Um, that's pretty uh, deep-seated. I mean, Freud said the child is father of the man, so there's a, there's a long legacy there that we need to um, pursue. But, but that doesn't, for me, that doesn't, um, <coughs> that doesn't erase a consideration of the institutional forms and the cultural forms. But for example, if you go to, um, uh, to a Cabramatta High School, there's nearly 1,200 kids there from 50 different language groups. Many of them have had the most appalling childhoods. And yet they have produced a culture there of reciprocity and trust um, and, um, and a sort of creative energy that is almost unimaginable. And when there are you know, difficult children in other schools around the state who, who, get, who are expelled, rather than punish them further, their first, the first strategy is to is to send them to Cabramatta High School to a cult to learn about to be immersed in a totally different uh, therapeutic culture so um, it, I'm, all I'm saying is that we don't have to be fatalistic about the you know you start off badly um, uh, and everything's uh, negative from then on although this week even the evidence about the treatment of children in orphanages, which only yesterday we regarded as the best repository for kids without parents, has exposed that you know the the negative consequences in terms of of, of vulnerability to serious illness, to premature death, to imprisonment, and so on is is um, challenging. Um, I have a question here from Stephen. He had to leave. He says. What does it say about Australia, maybe it's more of a comment, but that Amanda Vanstone has her own ABC radio show and Philip Ruddock is Mayor of Hornsby? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, 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 yeah, exactly. And it's, it's almost like you are rewarded. It's, it's, it's like in Israel, if you shoot a child and, and empty your 
all your bullets into a child, you get promoted. It, it, and it's, the, it's true. No, it's true. Social justice. The story that you told about Stuart being a great social justice activist reminded me of the, when I was on an immigrant boat from Piraeus to Australia, there were some Hungarian Jews and some Greeks. And amongst the Hungarian Jews, there was a, a kid who was Mongoloid, who was being bullied by Greek kids. It's got nothing to do with that. They were, kids, uh, they were Greek. They just happened to be kids who were picking on someone who was looking off. And I got involved and started to push the Greek kid out of the way. In the Greek kid fell down the stairs. I was 11 years old. And that nearly started a war between the Hungarians and Greeks on that ship. Now, maybe I was born with an innate sense of social justice. Uh, but my real question, though, is that, and this goes back to Stuart's harping back to anti-Semitism. Um, it's obvious that today's Palestinian people have very, very serious issues, both with the people who formed Israel. But looking at the issues of so many different groups of people around the world who have significantly greater issues, why is it that the issues of today's Palestinian people, and notice that I've said today's, are deemed to be almost more sexy in my view, potential. Okay, I'll tell you why, I very clearly, because it's the most brutal and longest occupation since the Second World War to a country that has been on the receiving end of massive supplies of arms and nuclear power against a people who've been completely disenfranchised whose rights to self-determination under the first paragraph of the Charter of the UN have never been recognized. It's got nothing to do with, with our critiques of, of other countries. I mean, the, the, Peace Fund, the, the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies in which I was involved went at great risk to West Papua to, fil to film and to, uh, uh, to um, publicize the, the genocide that was com committed by Kapasas. We did the same with what was happening to the Tamils in Sri Lanka. But this is the cruelest, the longest military occupation. And yet the, and yet the world is, or not the world, the West, particularly America. I mean, look, Israel, Israel forms American foreign policy. Israel is, is a state of the United States. I mean, the most powerful, the most powerful lobby in America is, is, is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. I mean, which, which, which has a blank check for cruelty because it won't allow uh, talk of injustice to occur. And we're, we're, there, are, there are cowardly politicians in Canberra desperately trying to emulate them. All I'm saying, I think, in, <laughs> that it's actually good for your mental health if you're willing to expose this and not, not indulge in the cop-out that you've got, to, you've got to mention everybody else in order to dare to say something about the, one of the biggest and longest injustices and the biggest pieces of political fraud, and I'm referring to the Balfour Declaration, in history. I just want to say that the only thing sexy about Palis the Palestinian matter is impotence. The moral impotence of world governments not to act on their obligations under international law to protect the political and human rights of the Palestinians. Impotence. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That brings us to the end of our proceedings tonight. Uh, we've we've uh, kicked around the topic of cruelty. Next week, we move to a more local concern, bad air in Western Sydney.
pollution, neglect, and the world's biggest incinerator. Our two speakers are Maureen Faruqi from the Greens and Anthony Lewis from the No Incinerator for Western Sydney Movement. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you for your contributions, financial, analytical, polemical, uh, and thanks particularly, of course, to our two wonderful speakers, uh, Bharti and uh, Stuart Rees. Thank you.